Hey Portico, my name is Rich Rivera and I am pastor at Restoration Community Church, an Acts 29 church plant in the South Bronx, New York City. Uh, and the plan was for me to be there with you all this morning. But due to a cracked windshield on my flight, um, I'm not there. I'm here. Saturday night, 1127, recording a sermon via video, uploading it, sending a link along, uh, and praying that God would use it mightily anyway. So thank you first and foremost for putting up with this highly unorthodox means of, of being with. Um, I pray that God would use this time in a mighty and powerful way. Um, I want to thank Pastors Chris and Pastor Justin for being super gracious and kind and allowing me to fulfill my obligations to you all this morning via this medium. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I am a native New Yorker. That's where we get this whole New Yorican thing. Um, I am the husband to Francis. I am father to Richard, 26, Alexandra, soon to be 16, and Benjamin, who is nine years old. Um, I am born and raised here in the Bronx. Um, God called me to stay home. Um, I planted the church in January of 2014 um, from a desire just to see uh, people know Jesus and his grace in such a profound way that we would see the chains fall off. Um, the South Bronx has historically, um, even as of the last census, 2010, um, has been the poorest congressional district in the country. There's a lot of hurt and a lot of brokenness here. Um, planting churches here is not an attractive thing. It is not uh, sexy by any means. It is difficult to work. But the truth is, planting a church anywhere is difficult. Um, your community, my community, both in need of a savior. Um, sin is ugly. Um, it's, it's just dressed a little different where I'm at. And um, hopefully one day I'll be able to, to be down there with you all and to share just kind of my heart for that. Uh, right now, what I, I plan to do is just to kind of jump into the text. Again, I'm just gonna ask you to, to, to rock with me as we, we kind of go through the text in this highly unorthodox manner. Um, it is super uncomfortable for someone like me to do this as, as I kind of feed off of people and I like to look at them and I like to walk around and I like to shake my hands and I like to do all those sorts of things. Um, but I, I, I know that God is able to even use even this to, to just kind of stir the affections of our hearts towards Jesus and to, to move us along and, to, and to, to move in us, through us and for us in such an undeniable way that we will know that we know that we know that we know that God met us powerfully. So what I want to do before I jump into the text is as, as a means of introduction, I, I want to just kind of quickly read what the church um, is to me. And, and, and I, I hope that you'll see it that way too. So the church, we, us, you and I, we are a tragically broken yet astoundingly beautiful people being brought together to display the great work of the Lord Jesus in the world. Or you can say that we, the church, are a picture of good news already here and yet to come, breaking through and disrupting the quote unquote every day with the glorious grace of God and his divine goodness. And I would add to that, that I firmly believe that the collective call of the church is to join Jesus in and on his mission to make sure that every child, woman, and man has the opportunity to know him, Jesus, and his justice. And what that means for us specifically at Restoration Community Church is this, our dream is to see the South Bronx get saved, revival. That's what we're in this for. We, we are in this to see people moved from, from death to life and, and to be moved from dark to light. We, we want the Spirit of, of God, the Holy Spirit, to break out in such a way that people's lives would be radically transformed. 
formed. Our work at restoration, our joy and our challenge is to be on the block for the city, showing off the glory of Christ, which is a fancy way of saying, and you probably heard this before, um, but this is a fancy way for us to say that our, our desire is to embody a theology of presence and to show up and to show off the glory of Christ. So what we, we try to do at Restoration is, is practice this, this idea of being with. The incarnation um, is a big deal and, and sometimes we kind of skip past that because if, if Jesus stepped into his own, that means that when he came to us, Mind you, he came to us, we didn't come to him. When he came to us, he made everywhere that we walk holy ground. So, so whether we're, we're all spiritually barefoot everywhere we go because we're stepping on holy ground. And you and I, the church, because we, we, we seek to embody this theology of presence, we, we have been blessed with an opportunity to shape fresh expressions of God's timeless truth into something that will grab a hold of our community's collective imagination and open up all of our hoods to the possibilities of God's grace in our lives and in our world. And if you were to ask me how I think all of this is possible, my answer would be this. It is all possible because of God's love for us. Not our love for Him, but His love to us. And this is what I like to call God's great love. Um, this is the title of today's sermon. Our text is Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. I will read that for us. I will pray and then we'll jump right in. Romans chapter 5. Verses 6 through 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Would you please pray with me? Father God, I pray that you would use this time, Lord, to move for your people in such a way that we would know that all of you is true and that everything else is a lie. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to open up your word and to share your beautiful, timeless truth with my brothers and sisters. And I just ask God that you would use this time to make it undeniable to us. I would ask that you would use my imperfect preaching and my faulty speech to make your grace beautiful and real to us all. Pray this all in your son's beautiful, powerful, and magnificent name. Amen. All right, so here we go. I'm just going to go verse by verse, and then we'll be done. Verse 6, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, Martin Lloyd-Jones, preaching on this particular verse, spoke the following statement, which I wholeheartedly amen. And I quote, I do not hesitate to assert that there is no greater statement of the love of God than in that verse. That verse being verse 6. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, the question that I have to ask myself as, as I read this verse, or better still, as this verse reads me, because that's kind of how I feel when I approach God's Word. I don't read it as much as it reads me. The question that I ask myself is this, was I ever strong? Was there ever a moment where I was able to lift myself up out of death and walk out into life? 
Was there ever a moment where out of my spiritual poverty, I was able to purchase freedom from the bondage of sin and secure an eternal resting place in the presence of glory? Of course not. I was never that strong. But here's the thing. Where I was weak, the Lord was strong. And not only is God strong, not only is His grace sufficient, not only is His strength made perfect in weakness, as if all of this wasn't enough, God is also always on time. The text says so. For while we were still weak at the right time, Time. Now, some scholars would say that this at the right time is at the right time in human history. God stepped in and intervened through his son to save and to redeem a people for himself. Because if you read all of the Old Testament, it seems as some scholars would think that there was enough time for people to figure out that they couldn't get it right. They had all the opportunities, they had all the chances, they had the prophets, they had the monarchies, they had the judges, they had all of this, and yet still, they did not have their king. They did not have rescue. There is also, there are, or, or there are also those who believe that at the right time is the right time. Meaning, when God sovereignly moves on us and takes us from death to life, that is the right time. I'm not here to argue one or the other. I'm just going to say, there is never a wrong time. There is never a wrong time to be rescued and saved. Never. Is there ever a wrong time to be visited by the grace of God and, in spite of our undeserving behavior, be met with the offer of new life than the gift of salvation? No. Can there ever be a wrong time for that? Is, 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 it ever, is there ever a wrong time for Christ to die for the ungodly? No. In, in fact, I think that this, this is a great demonstration of God's love. In, in 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, we read this. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Christ died. This is how Jesus saves, not by his teaching alone, as some people like to think, and not by his example alone, as some others like to believe. No, in order to save us, he had to die for us. Better still, he had to rise for us. The letter to the Hebrews says this clearly. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. And because he tasted death, you and I can taste the sweet savor of life everlasting because Jesus laid down his life, then he picked it back up again. This is why we can walk the walk, and this is why we can talk the talk. Verse 7, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. Now God's love is greater than human love. God's love is greater than human love. One commentator um, says this, The whole matter, salvation, springs from the love of God. Jesus did not come to change God's attitude. He came to show what it is and always was. He came to prove beyond question that God is love. And beloved, you and I, we, the church, we have to know this if we're ever going to live the life of ministry that is, in many ways, a mystery. And if we don't get this right, we'll be in trouble. Listen to this quote um, from Henry Nouwen's book, In the Name of Jesus, and I quote, We aren't the healers, we aren't the reconcilers, 
We are not the givers of life. We are sinful, broken, vulnerable people who need as much care as anyone we care for. The mystery of ministry is that we have been chosen to make our own limited and very conditional love the gateway for the unlimited and unconditional love of God. Now that, beloved, is absolutely beautiful. Verse 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, if verse 6 is a great and grand statement of God's love, then verse 8 is a great and grand demonstration of God's love. See, apart from Christ, we, you and I, the church, are ungodly. We are helpless. We are hopeless. God's love reached out for us, reached out to us while we were still helpless, while we were still weak. God did not sit back and wait for us to get it all together. If that was the case, he would still be waiting. Instead, God moved while we weren't because he knew we would never be. And if we know this to be true, and if we are ever going to live in light of the great truth of Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, then, then we're going to have to know this very next statement to be true above all things for us. We, we can't be a born-again people and still do the same dead things. We, we can't live in light of God's great love, be born again, and still do the same things. We, you and I, the church, we are called to walk. We read this in, in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. We, we read this specifically in one of my favorite verses in all the scriptures, Ephesians 2.10, where the apostle Paul writes, For we, you and I, the church, are God's workmanship, His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good walks that God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. Now, this word workmanship in the Greek um, it is poema. Um, it is the, the Greek word we get our English word poem from. And, and if you could allow me, if, if, if I can rock a little bit, if I can use a little bit of my biblical imagination, I would read Ephesians 2.10 like this. Um, we, you and I, the church, we are the poetic expression of God's goodness here on earth. We are the poetic expression of God's goodness here on earth. Um, if, if I can just go back to the beginning and, and just kind of restate, reread what I shared up front about uh, what I believe to be true about the church. Um, we, the church, you and I, we are a tragically broken yet astoundingly beautiful people being brought together to display the great work of the Lord Jesus in the world. We, you and I, the church, are a picture of good news that is already here and is yet to come, breaking through and disrupting the quote-unquote every day with the glorious grace of God and His divine goodness. It is our job to live our lives in such a way that every man woman and child or every child woman and man has the opportunity to know him Jesus and experience his justice now here's the thing the cross of Christ changes our status before a good just and loving God amen but it is the resurrection life of Christ that changes our state. We, we are moved from dark to light and from death to life by the cross of Christ. But we walk in the newness of life. We become the poetic expression of God's goodness here on earth because of Jesus' resurrection life. 
because he laid down his life, picked it back up again, you and I are able to experience the possibilities of God's grace, the possibilities of God's power, pushing back the darkness and the evil of our world. And beloved, don't get it twisted. Our world is, 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 is indeed dark and evil. There are some ugly things going on. And if all we do inside of the church is preach a gospel of personal salvation, we are doing the whole of the gospel injustice. It is our job, our duty as saved, set apart people to make sure that every child, every woman, and every man has the opportunity to know Jesus and experience his justice. Um, preaching a gospel of personal salvation alone without preaching the way of the king is, and, and this is strictly New York language, but, but maybe you'll get it, maybe you won't. If, if all we do is preach a gospel of, of personal salvation without preaching the way of the king, what we're doing is committing a quality of life crime. We are severely diminishing the quality of life that is ours in Christ. We, we can't possibly be born again people and do the same dead things. We need all of Jesus to, to redeem all of this broken world. We and, and our lives are a part of that, but, but what we do with our lives is a bigger part of that in our day to day. So we, we just need to know that, and I just wanted to say that. So the cross of Christ changes our status before a good, just, and loving God, but it is the resurrection and life of Christ that changes our state. Now, let me tell you a little bit about my community. I'm going to go a little more in depth without getting deep. Again, it is my desire to one day be with you and to, to just really talk um, I, I want to confess that it is difficult not seeing your face um, and, 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 and being with you, and yet doing this. But it is, like I stated earlier, my, my deep, sincere prayer that God would move through this anyway. Um, but here's the thing. My community is absolutely beautiful. We are not lazy. We are not incapable. We are not any more sinful than anyone else. Um, we live within a system, with, within a governed set of laws that has systemically um, put others before some. And because of that, People in, in lower income inner city communities and, and just poor communities nationwide, um, globally, have to work sometimes four times as hard just to do the same things. Now, um, the South Bronx is just a few subway stops away from some of the wealthiest communities in our country. Yet, we have historically been the poorest congressional district in the country. Wherever Christians exist, those type of numbers shouldn't exist. Um, there's a, a statistic floating around, in particular when it comes to my community, the South Bronx, that, that says that 39.6% of the families last year did not have enough money to adequately feed their children or feed their family. They, they call this food insecurity. Now, as long as there are Christians in this world, I think we can safely say that there should never be a stat uh, entitled food insecurity. No one should be insecure about whether they are going to eat or not. Um, as long as there are Christians in this world, we, we, we need to demonstrate God's goodness. We need to be those things that I read about at the beginning. Um, I'll read them again because I truly believe this. We, the church, are a tragically broken yet astoundingly beautiful people being brought together 
to display the great work of the Lord Jesus in the world. You can say that we are a picture of good news that is already here and is yet to come, breaking through and disrupting the quote-unquote every day with the glorious grace of God and His divine goodness. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'm grateful for this partnership with you all. Um, I'm blessed to even be alive and, and, and to be allowed to do what I do. Um, I firmly believe that, that we don't get saved to sit. We get saved to be sent. I don't know what that means for you, but I know what that means for us. And I think it means the same thing for you. We, the church, will not stop until we spend ourselves to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to know Jesus and experience his justice. This is why partnerships like ours are so important. What you guys do is you allow us to do the work um, here in a very difficult place um, to, to, to work towards that, to ensure that. You're a help to us. We, we can't do this without you, but here's the thing. You can't be the church without us. We're one big happy family, whether we know each other or not. My deepest desire is that we would get to know one another, that we wouldn't just be um, a people over there. Um, we'd be a family. I I'm grateful for this opportunity that I had to share with you a little bit of my heart out of God's word. Um, again, highly unorthodox method. I still believe God will use this in a powerful way. Um, I love y'all, even if I don't know y'all yet. Um, I, I just ask that you continue to pray for us here. We're in the midst of a lot of things. We're, we're trying to see some things happen. We're, we're trying to move into our own space. We currently rent inside of another church and it kind of handicaps and, and, and limits our, our growth in a sense. Like we, we, we are constricted by time. We're sandwiched in between other churches. And, and we, we believe that we are called to be with people, to be on the block, to be present to embody a theology of presence, to do all these things, and to do that, a space would help. So I'm just asking you guys to please pray with us. We're raising some extra money to make that happen right now, and, and we're starting some talks to, to work towards those ends. So thank you for allowing me to do this. Um, I pray that um, this was a blessing to you. Um, I, I really do look forward to being with you all at some point. Again, thank you, Pastor Chris, Pastor Justin, the rest of the leadership at Portico, God bless y'all. Y'all mean the world to us. We love you. Hope to see you all soon. God bless and uh, goodbye from now from the South Bronx. Peace.